We're not worthy! We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the channel. I'm your host, BJ Mambo. Tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about the fourth album by the Alice Cooper group, Killer. Released November 27th, 1971. This album is produced by Bob Ezrin, features eight tracks, and has a runtime of 37 minutes and eight seconds. This is the second album these guys released in 1971. This is around the time when that seemed like that was just the normal bands releasing multiple albums a year. You know, Kiss did it, then even going back, Beatles and Stones. Like, everyone just released multiple albums a year, which is crazy to think. Going into this, I was interested to see how Killer really does compare to Love to Death, because I used to really love Killer. And I used to always think it was my favorite, and I liked it more than Love to Death. Then recently I kind of flip-flopped and thought Love to Death is maybe a little bit better, and I don't know, listening to this again, it's a pretty damn good album. Let's get into it. Track one, Under My Wheels, two minutes and 51 seconds. The telephone is ringing. You got that great guitar riff opening up, drums building up, boom, into the lyrics, man. Excellent way. To start the album. His voice is very heavy in this one, which is cool. Raspy. I think maybe just some cymbal. Crashes with the drums. Really subtle, simple. Then you jump into that bridge pre-chorus. I'm not sure what it is, but you know, they've got the double time. Take me to the show. You know, kind of speeds up, switches up. A cool little part. Um, if I really want to nitpick the song, maybe that little section as far as, in my opinion, the catchiness is my least favorite part. But it's the only time you hear it. It's short, it's quick. So again, me even saying that is just like a nitpick. And it's still catchy, it's, it's, it's still good. Then you go back to a verse two. I don't think there's any musical changes. Seems like it's about the same. Then he ends saying, under my wheels, and it cuts into the solo. Got some, what I call dueling guitars. Got two riffs going on. And then boom, kicking these horns, which I don't think you've heard yet on Alice Cooper albums. Then he has that nice raspy scream, then boom, repeats verse one, which works perfectly. I think they almost repeat verse one, or maybe that's a chorus. I don't know what part that is to call it with the telephone is ringing, but it's easy to say, it's catchy, so why not say it again? But there's so much going on musically. It really builds up and it just has this big, powerful finale, this big, epic finale, a nice fade out. Horns going, epic, boom. Awesome opening. Still, I think he plays every live show. I'm, I'm pretty sure he plays this song, which he should. It's one of the singles of this album. It totally makes sense. But yeah, great opening. Um, again, if you want to compare it to Love to Death, I love Caught in the Dream, but this compared to that, I would have to go with this song. I think it's a great opener, great way to start. So let's uh, go to the next track. Track two, Be My Lover. Three minutes and 21 seconds. Before I jump into this, I wanted to say recently I was listening to the radio and the car song, Best Friend's Girl, came on the radio. I was listening to the, the verse, melody. Like, What does this sound like? Oh, that's Be My Lover, Alice Cooper. I was like, wow, these guys, I mean, again, coincidences or... I'm not saying they ripped off that, but if you guys know that song, The Cars, Best Friends Girl, listen to that verse and the verse to Be My Lover, and I think you'll I think you'll probably hear it too. Back to the song, man. Great, simple opening riff. Different speed than Under My Wheels, so structurally, it was a nice kind of track two feel. You got some drum hits, just kind of keeping it, keeping it pumping. Bass comes in halfway through the first verse adding a little bit of extra meat. And you got an awesome little guitar riff that leads right into the chorus. And then boom, big awesome chorus. You got the oohs and the ahs going on in the background, uh, which, you know, I'm always down with. More of that double guitar that you hear in almost every song. Verse two comes in, it's nice, it's beefed up. Going with that structure, again, I'll probably keep repeating myself, but that classic structure, more bass guitar, the instruments seem a little bit louder. Uh, Alice's voice maybe a little bit raspier, heavier. Drums are really standing out in this one, sounds spot on. Then you get this awesome little build up and then it slows down. Oh, baby, if you wanna be my lover. You know, awesome way to end it, man. I love stuff like that, man. I love those little switches. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a tempo change necessarily, but 
Could be. Got the nice long scream at the end. Sounds like they drop a drumstick. Maybe. The huge finale, man. And man, what an awesome song. Again, another single, well-deserved single. And again, to compare this to Love to Death, first two tracks, you got Caught in a Dream and I'm 18, which I'm 18 was a huge hit. But I think Be My Lover compared to I'm 18, I think this blows it out of the water, man. I think this is a great song. I think this might be a perfect song. Awesome way to start an album. It's only eight track album, which is good. I want to add, I do like that it's eight track because those nine track or odd number albums always kind of tweak me out. Six more to go. So let's, uh, let's go. Track three, Halo of Flies. Eight minutes, 22 seconds. Getting back into that progressive rock, psychedelic sound that they were, at the time, more so famous for doing. They're doing that, it's from a TV show, the riff, uh, and I'm not sure what it is. Drums jump in, bass comes in. It's a long song, eight minute song, so expect a decently long build up but so far man it's sounding awesome then there's a little bit of a switch and you got those keys bah, 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 those kind of repetitive hits there's actually so much going on especially with those headphones on uh that's one thing listening to this song specifically i definitely appreciate it more with those guys in because you just hear everything that's going on and there's so much so much going on that when i was taking these notes it was like impossible i'm like there's too much going on but it seems to be working so it's cool then the vocals come in, tapping your foot. He jumps into a little bit of a song of music. Song of music, that's not right. He jumps into a little bit of a sound of music, and then we got another switch. So the progressiveness is really kicking in and, and, and pretty quickly on. But I think the tempo is still the same. I think you still got that bump, bump, bump. You still got that same thing going. So, so far, it's been a pretty smooth drive. I like how the drum hits are fading in and out. Alice says a few more words, and he, you know, Halo of Lies, has that long thing. Starts building up, speeding up, fast guitar strumming. Then it feels, seems like it has another bit of a solo, almost like an Egyptian sound. I was listening to it, I was thinking like, it has like this Egyptian feel. The music speeds up again, then it goes back to slow. Just kind of just riding this funky wave. Then it goes to another TV theme, which, I thought it was Hawaii Five-O, but it's totally not, because that's ba 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 ba. This is bam bam ba dum bam ba dum bam ba dum. What is that from? I should know. I'm sure it's documented. Um, but please, someone, comment. Huge finale. Got those guitar slides. Boom. Hit final. So much going on. Really, again, listening to those headphones, I'm like, damn, this is a complex song, man. Hard to take notes on. There's so much going on. I'm like. This is too much going on. Is it too much going on? I know that's a complaint about this album, the overproduction of it all, but this actually held up better than I was thinking. I thought I was more about the Black Juju, because if you want to compare tracks, but maybe this one might be a little bit better. I don't know. Great song. So I'm down. Let's go to track four. Track four, Desperado. Three minutes, 30 seconds. Famously said to be written about Jim Morrison. I think he might have passed around this time, so it might be a nice little um, dedication to him, so that's nice. Get that nice eerie guitar opening, slow pace, ballad sounding almost. So, you know, you don't realize how many ballads this dude and this band has done until you really start going through these. And I know later on Cooper does a lot of ballads, but this is the closest one, at least part of this song. And you get the hard, and you get da 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 da. He starts getting that raspiness out. Doesn't sound soft ballad, nice, eerie anymore. Now it's it's heavy, it's hard hitting, and it feels nice. Then you go into verse two. Now the drums are double time. Sticking with that structure. I don't know if that's an Ezrin call or just the standard call, but. You know, you pick that up on almost every one of these tracks. Then you cut into that string solo. And maybe acoustic guitar is what's playing. It sounds like acoustic guitar, but the strings are kind of what's taken over. And and I don't mind it. You know, I think it was a cool touch. And again, there might have been a little bit in the last track, but this is really in your face and stringy. And, and this can maybe turn people 
away because it's kind of dipping too far away from the rock sound, getting kind of that orchestra sound, overproduced, as fans can maybe put that. But, you know, I think it works, and they don't do it really, maybe in the a later track, but it's not like there's strings in every song. If that was the case, then they would really be like, all right, with the strings. But for this, it, it works, man. And if it's a nice song, it's about a memory of, of a dude, then... Let's throw in some strings, man. Do you want more chorus? But now you got the strings, some string hits, cello. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what strings are going on, but like plucking, st string plucking is that the term? The nice little ending and that end side one. That's a pretty uh, flawless first side, man. You know, it's and it's and they're all different. Each song sounded different. So let's flip this album over. There's four left. Let's see if uh, let's see how side B is. Let's do it. Track five. You drive me nervous. Two minutes, 28 seconds. The shortest song on the album. Short, yet sweet. Guitarists sound awesome, this one, man. This is one, I mean, it stands out in other tracks, but I feel like this one's really like, oh yeah, 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 really, I feel like feeling the guitar. Bass a little bit subtle, a little bit kind of in the background at first, that guitar's taking over, but bass finds its way. Alice's voice is really heavy and extreme. A little bit of a musical break. Go into another verse, you got that fun little, hey honey, what's your name? Like, I'm not sure what he says, but that deep, almost like a Frankenstein esque voice, which was a fun little, a fun little uh, treat. You got that high pitched screaming going on, maybe the heaviest he's sounded so far in this album. Kind of sounds like the wake up, wake up from Black Juju. Just wanted to do that, wake up again. Then you got some great hits to close the song, but yeah, I don't know, it's such a tight, short song that. It kind of gets by you pretty quickly, uh, but it's a good one, a good opener. You can be um, my slave and I'll be let's do it. Track six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three minutes and thirty-nine seconds. A little bit of a lame title, maybe. Vocal starting the song, which is a nice little change. Most of the time, the guitar seems to be playing along with the melody of the of the lyrics, um, but it's a catchy little melody, so it's all right. Feels like maybe the most tame song so far, like. Not overly produced, it's kind of more raw, basic, stripped down. Go into verse two, a little bit more guitar going on. Nothing, no huge difference, there's no double time or anything, but maybe a little bit of extra guitar playing. Then you get another music break. Guitar, I don't know, it didn't stand out too much. Again, maybe the weakest guitar so far, maybe even the weakest song so far out of these first six, but still a good song. About the 143 mark, you hit another solo, and here's where it picks up. Get some harmonica coming in, Alice doing it, sound awesome. Great that, I, I like how it's, when he does it, it's, it's, it's really only here and there, and maybe only one song per album, except for the second album, but I could be wrong, but it's always nice when he comes in with that, with that guy. So the songs have more of a, so it's getting a little bit more of a bluesy feel, which again is keeping it different than basically each one of these tracks so far. So that's why this album has been, I feel, playing pretty well. We got into another chorus, verse, chorus, whatever section it is. He says, yeah, 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 it hits. And this is where I think the song should have ended, but it jumps into another verse, maybe a verse three, and I feel like, eh, you're starting to drag a little bit. It's not a bad song, but ultimately, as much as I love the the mouth organ, uh, probably my least favorite so far. But again, that's six songs. You got two left. So even if that song sucked, which it didn't, it's still an awesome album. So we got two left. Let's do it. Dead Track babies. seven, Dead Babies. Five minutes and 44 seconds. Pretty controversial title, clearly. You know, this is the, you know, I get the albums right there. It's kind of beat up copy, but there it is. But it's a track on the album that I'm sure every parent put that back. You know what I mean? That's the ultimate parental red flag. But knowing what the song is actually about and the message it's saying is it's about poor parenting. So ultimately, in a weird, twisted way, it is kind of a positive, not a positive, but like a, a more of an awareness type of song. Um, 
So you can maybe look at it at a different perspective. But still, you got that title. I mean, it's still an upsetting title, but at least the message behind it isn't twisted. You got that great opening riff. I think it's bass. Clean bass guitar, unless it is guitar. I really couldn't tell. Um, I, I want to say bass. Sound like bass. And you got the baby crying sound effect, which is sad and, you know, but it goes with the song. Dead baby. Did awesome riff in between. Probably the best riff of the album. I think guitar and bass. I think they're just playing along with each other, but why not? You got those. I don't know if that's a female singer or maybe one of the dudes doing falsetto, but. Uh, creepy and totally fits perfect with this. Going to verse two, drums now doing double time. Again, back to that structure that almost every one of these songs so far have, which again, if you want to pick the album apart and complain about that, I mean, but again, it's, it's just that structure. And then you get that great eerie solo coming in. This is definitely the creepiest song so far, I would have to say. Drums really standing out a little bit more so in this song. Then you get a nice little change. Goodbye, little lady. Got those kind of downward things. It goes, gets heavier. Let it so long. Changes up again. So you're kind of getting back into that progressive rock area maybe not as much psychedelic maybe a little bit but more maybe the progressive side uh again a long song so you know it's got to have some sort of change right organ coming in maybe ezrin uh maybe is this the first organ so far in this album I think there's a lot in love to death i don't not so much in this one i mean i'm sure there was organ in other songs but i feel like this is the first time i was like ah oh, organ and you get some more horns coming in Again, a couple songs in between the horns, so I feel like it still works. I could see people complaining again about it, but, you know, what are you going to do? And you go back to one big final chorus, got some more horns, kind of like a medieval sounding, like triumphant horns. Then you got one more, goodbye little baby. Got that crowd, that upset crowd. And then it does one of those transitions to track eight. The last track. Let's do it. Track eight, Killer. Six minutes, 57 seconds. Got this awesome bass. Heavy distorted guitar, fading in and out. Vocals come in. Another catchy melody. Again, every one of these songs with, with, the, with the vocals and the melody, I think just has been it's pretty spot on with the catchiness. Kind of a bluesy sound, again, you know, jazz club or something. You got verse two, Niles is screaming it. He's heavy. They've done that on other songs. So I guess maybe there's a similarity to the songs as far as that. But again, man, it's showing his range of he could sing soft, he could sing low like Jim Morrison. Then he could get that raspiness. And that's what makes his voice unique but another great solo double guitars again the bass is kind of keeping it bopping it's subtle but it's there then it starts slowing down at the 335 mark that's when you jump into straight up horror i mean this is the rest of the song from here out is a horror movie theme and there's three minutes and 21 seconds left so this is a big chunk this is a song within a song this could these this track could have been split probably it could have been another transition and had this kind of finale thing. Maybe that would have been a cool call because three minutes and 21 seconds, it is long. But putting it in perspective, this is 1971. Has anything like this existed yet or before? You totally, this song, you could totally hear where Rob Zombie, I mean, there was definitely always inspiration. I mean, a lot of people are probably inspired by Alice Cooper, but Rob Zombie definitely, and this song is a good example. Like, oh, this is like a Rob Zombie type thing. You got that Latin uh, exorcism ritual priest. I don't know who, I don't know what they're saying, but it's in their voice. I don't know if it's Bob Ezra. I'm not who, sure who it is, but it's in there and it's creepy. I feel like it almost sounds a little bit like the Suspiria theme from Goblin. I feel like there's parts of this that kind of remind me of it. Then you even get those drums at some point, which Suspiria did. So 
and that was six years after this album, so there could have totally been inspiration there as well. And you get that organ, that Dracula castle type organ coming in. But is this too long? I mean, I enjoy it. It's fun. You know, it would be perfect for Halloween or Halloween time. You could throw this on. I mean, it's this is Halloween music. Um, but I have to say, I think it might be... I might consider this track somewhat of a negative just because that goes on for quite a while. Again, I don't mind it. And as a horror fan, like, it's all good. You know, Love of the Death had Sun Arise, had that big valley, that fade out, that bigger thing. This kind of going the musical horror route. Um, but again, it's also a different route. So between both albums, there's definitely a difference. So, you know, that's definitely a positive. But then about the 630 spot is when you hear that that record scratch cut, and then you got that weird, that weird alien spaceship type sound. I think they were going for, like, the record's effed up, and it's scratch, and it's all like, oh, what's going on? Like, I wonder how many people playing that were like, oh, shit, and popped it off real quick and be like, oh, that's part of the, that's part of it. So, I, that was a fun little bit. Uh, that was cool. You know, they could have always kept that, but that three-minute musical part maybe could have been cut final thoughts i tell you man for the longest time this was probably my favorite album and then recently you know listening to all this cooper love to death kind of took over and i said nah, i think love to death is better but i don't know man listen to this i like that it's eight tracks love to death is nine like i said earlier those odd numbered albums kind of weird me out because like, unless you physically have the album, like, how would you know when to flip it? You know what I mean? So at least with this, you got eight, okay, in theory, track four, you would flip it. Sure, there's circumstances, like that Marvin Gaye album, What's Going On, there's like three tracks on one side and like five or six on the other. It's a completely bizarre uh, thing. But this one, nice, even number, eight tracks, four, four. So I like the saying it's confusing but i like the even numbers um yeah the main negative you know maybe the last couple tracks like yeah 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 was maybe but it's still a good song though that's the thing like i don't think there was a bad song in this album you know if you would recommend this album to someone especially if they're non alice cooper fan I would always like give someone the heads up like look there's moments that might go on for a while and i would say this last track if you want, when the music starts kicking in, you could always just end it. If you really wanted to, you know, I would listen, you know, I would listen it out. Under My Wheels, Be My Lover are definitely my top two. If there was a hangout playlist or something, you know, put together something, people are, those two songs for sure. It's crazy they did that and Love to Death the same year. And which one's better? I really don't know. You know, I'm going to probably be saying this a lot through this series, but this is really going to be hard to, to rank. Just like that, the video's over. If you guys made it this far, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I post weekly. Feel free to come back, like, subscribe. Definitely comment. I want to talk to other Cooper fans. I know it's a popular album. I'm sure there's a lot we could talk about. Definitely one of my favorite albums. Uh, seems to be a fan favorite. You know, next up is School's Out, which has probably their biggest hit. Um, it's a very interesting album. Also, I think, produced by Bob Ezrin. Again, I did not know Bob Ezrin produced this album, but there you go. We're all learning something, I guess. Huh? I'll leave some links for some other videos you guys want to check out. And, yeah, thanks again, and I'll catch all you Cooper fans later. Thanks for watching.